Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Catherine, and I'm the Community Relations Coordinator here at Gifford. Probably talked to a few of you on the phone. Um, and just wanted to say thank you all for being here and spending part of your Friday morning with us, especially going into nice weather. Hi, everyone. Um, I see some familiar faces out there, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Leslie Osterman, and I'm a physician assistant here in um, cardiology with Dr. Andrus. So while we wait for him, I'll just go ahead and get started on my presentation. So I'm presenting on atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, which is a topic of interest to me, and hopefully you'll find it um, helpful and interesting as well. So in this presentation, just an overview of what we're gonna be talking about. So the, the normal um, electrical signal of the heart, what is atrial fibrillation? What is atrial flutter? Um, what puts you at risk for these abnormal rhythms? How are they evaluated? How are they treated? Um, and just some symptoms you might um, have if you have atrial fibrillation or flutter. So we'll start with just going, reviewing the normal um, electric signal of the heart. So the pumping function of the heart really relies on electricity moving through the heart to allow it to contract. So the normal signal moves from the top of the heart called the sinoatrial node, or you might have heard the SA node, and then it moves through both of those top chambers of the heart called the atria in a very um, quick and um, linear way um, to allow those top chambers to contract. And then it moves down kind of to the center of the heart, all the way to the bottom chambers called the ventricles. Um, and we rely on this again for that normal pumping function of the heart. So the way that we can see if the normal electricity of the heart or the electricity is moving normally is by looking at an EKG or an electrocardiogram, which you may have heard of. So down on the bottom part of my slide here, you'll see four beats of an EKG. And that first little bump that you see on the EKG, that's what we call the P wave. And the P wave is showing the electricity moving from the, that top chamber, the atria. And so as it, what's called depolarizes, or the electricity moves through, and that um, you get the contraction of that top chamber, you get the P wave. And then the next little blip that you see, we call the QRS complex. And that's what we see on an EKG when the electricity is moving through the bottom chambers of the heart or the ventricles. And then lastly, you have the T wave, which is repolarization or the heart relaxing and getting ready for another heartbeat. So what is atrial fibrillation? So atrial fibrillation is when the electricity is not moving through this nice organized pattern and it's moving in those top chambers of the heart, the atria, in a very chaotic and disorganized way. So that signal is coming from a space that's other than the SA node um, and creating this, this quivering or fibrillation. Um, and then with every um, so many beats, sometimes it gets down into the ventricle, that bottom chamber of the heart. And you can see on the EKG here, you can see there's that fibrillation in that kind of straight line, or sometimes there's, you know, there's not even um, anything clear there. And then in a very irregular pattern, you can see when that electrical signal is getting down to the bottom chambers of the heart. And then what is atrial flutter? So atrial flutter is similar in that that normal electrical conduction is not, again, coming from the SA node. It's coming from a different place in the atria. Um, but unlike atrial fibrillation, which is um, this chaotic, you know, random quivering, it has more of a regular pattern that it's following, but it's simply not following the pattern that it's supposed to be following. So it's following this loop. And then um, much more regularly, it's moving down to those bottom chambers of the heart and causing um, that contraction of, of the heart. And you can see that here on the bottom of the EKG, it's, it's much more regular but you can see in between that there's that really coarse, um, we call it sawtooth pattern of the flutter waves, so that abnormal conduction through the loop. There's two different kinds of atrial flutter, typical and atypical, and that's just 
um, is designating which loop it's going through. Um, so what puts you at risk? What are the causes of atrial fibrillation? So we have a pretty good understanding of what disease processes put you at risk for atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, the exact mechanism of what's happening to um, from these disease processes to cause this abnormal rhythm is a little less clear. Um, but some of the, um, the main hypotheses are that these diseases cause inflammation, or they cause scar tissue, or they cause an abnormal stretch of the heart, which can lead to the cells that are supposed to be moving in this very, um, um, you know, coordinated way to not to not be sending the signals in, in coordination as they should be, um, leading to these abnormal rhythms. So some of the diseases that we think about, some of them are cardiovascular diseases like high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, problems with the valves of your heart. Um, other diseases are diabetes, obesity, thyroid disease. Some things are um, untreated sleep apnea. Some things are lifestyle related. Um, so whether you're a smoker or um, excessive alcohol use, all of those things can lead to that inflammation and scarring and sometimes stretching of the atria leading to these abnormal rhythms. So how do we evaluate atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? So as I showed on that first slide, um, an EKG, often if we can catch atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter when it's happening, we can see it simply on a few second um, EKG, which is looking at the rhythm of your heart. Um, for some reason that middle photo didn't show up, but that should have been a picture of a rhythm monitor, which is, um, to put it simply, almost like a sticker that you put on your chest. And that can look at your heart rhythm anywhere from one day, 24 hours, up to 30 days. So we can get a pretty um, big um, data set from that if you're wearing it for a longer period of time. We now have you know, wearables that people wear, smart watches that can help detect um, abnormal rhythms. And sometimes they're picked up on that. Um, for other people that their symptoms are so infrequent, we can put in what's called an implantable loop recorder. And this um, is, looks like a little bit smaller than a thumb drive. It's inserted into the chest wall, into the subcutaneous tissue, and that can be in place for up to three years to look for atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter or other abnormal rhythms of the heart. Um, if we suspect that you have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or we've detected it, one other thing that we like to do is an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of your heart. And that picture all the way on the left is showing that ultrasound, or one view of the ultrasound. And that's is looking at the overall structure of the heart, whether those um, chambers are stretched in any way, whether there's clot present, which is a problem that can be related to these abnormal rhythms, um, how the valves are working, the overall pumping function of the heart whether you're really getting um, what you need for you know, function and um, structure. How do we treat these abnormal rhythms? Um, the treatment is often really patient specific. So how symptomatic are you? How often is this happening? Um, and, and personal choice. So some things um, that we, you know, the first thing that we really think about when we're treating these is um, going down either rate or rhythm control. So for rate control, um, what that means is that we're not attempting to stop this abnormal rhythm from happening. We just want to ensure that when you're in this abnormal rhythm, that your heartbeat is not going so fast that you're, you're not able to keep up with that good feel, filling and contracting of the heart, which can lead you to symptoms and um, heart failure. And that's often managed with just medication that you take, um, just be a pill. Um, then if you go to the other side of the approach for um, treatment would be rhythm control. So rhythm control is um, 
is a treatment that its goal is to get you out of this abnormal rhythm and into a normal rhythm, that normal pattern that we like to see coming from the top chambers going down. And that can be done in many different ways. Um, sometimes we recommend cardioversion, which is essentially shocking the heart, um, trying to bring it back to that normal pattern that we like to see coming from that top chamber going down, so stopping that, those abnormal rhythms from um, getting in the way of the normal electro, electrical pathway. Um, other times we give you medication, and sometimes that's taken as needed if you can feel your abnormal rhythm, um, and that can bring you back. Um, other times you need to take it every day, the medications. Um, there's also um, ablation, which is another option for some people to get you back um, into normal rhythm, and that's essentially going with a catheter into the heart and creating a fence around where those abnormal um, focuses are coming from and, and stopping them from getting into the normal cycle. Um, and depending on what rhythm you have is um, where they will go within the heart. The other thing we think about when you have an abnormal rhythm like this is um, anti-clotting medication or what we um, call anticoagulation. So as you can imagine, you know, the body is made so that if you're bleeding, you clot, and that's very protective and very important. But when you are in one of these abnormal rhythms, you can imagine thinking back to one of those first slides where that was the top chambers were very chaotic and fibrillating. You can imagine that the blood isn't filling and pumping through the heart as it should. And with any kind of you know, abnormal currents of the blood, you can have a clot. And that clot, um, especially from the left side of the heart, you know, goes down to the bottom, um, bottom chamber and then has a direct pathway to the brain, which can lead to a pretty significant stroke, um, which is um, you know, life changing. So um, what we do when we see you is we determine what's called your chads 2 vasc score. So this is um, a score that determines your risk of clotting, um, and we compare that to your risk of bleeding, because as you can imagine, blood thinners you know, will increase bleeding. And if it's been determined that your risk of clotting is high enough, then we will recommend these types of medications. So the way that these medications work, um, that very busy picture on the left side is the way that we normally clot. And these medications go into that pathway and they stop it in a certain section so that you have, um, you are less likely to clot, less likely to create that um, thrombus that can lead to a stroke. Um, lastly, um, for some people who aren't able to tolerate blood thinners because um, something has happened, like a gastrointestinal bleed or a bleed in their brain, um, for some people there's a left atrial um, appendage occlusion. So on the left side of the heart, we were born with this little pocket on the left atria, and I'm sorry I didn't um, include a picture of this, but if you kind of imagine like an outpouching of the left side of the heart, Within that, you can imagine that um, just like a current in the river, if there's a spot that the current can move outside of the normal flow, it's more likely to be um, you know, a place that a clock could form. So the way the Watchman device, Watchman is a brand, apologize for that, but the way that this device works is um, they, they cover it, they insert a catheter and they um, within the catheter, it almost looks like a butterfly comes out and they put it against that appendage, that outpouching, and close it off so that you no longer have that space in your heart that's more likely for a clot to form. And that can be a way to avoid um, things like, like warfarin or apixaban, some of these clotting medications. Um, so when, when should we think about atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter? What are some of the signs and symptoms that you may be experiencing? So if you're feeling um, what we call palpitations of fluttering or abnormal rhythm in your chest, then that would be a good reason to call. Some people feel lightheaded. Some people have shortness of breath. 
um, um, or just incredible fatigue, if you're feeling really tired, dizzy, that would be a good, a good reason to call your primary care provider or if you're already um, a patient of ours, give us a call directly um, and we would be happy to see you and evaluate you for any of these abnormal rhythms in the cardiology clinic. Any questions for me? I know that was a lot and hopefully I didn't confuse you too much. Any questions about atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter or the normal conduction system of the heart? I'm going to take that as we got it. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Bruce Andrus, uh, and it's a pleasure to see so many, so many people here. Um, I want to make this informal, uh, so if you have questions or want to interrupt, that's fine. I uh, want to talk about the things that are of interest to the audience. Um, I'm taking a guess at that. Um, sorry for, for being late. I, my, uh, my 8 o'clock patient is uh, traveling from the Concord, New Hampshire area got lost and arrived here late, and I, I, um, I said, of course, I'll see you. Put that punk a little bit behind. Uh, so I, I have kind of an ambitious agenda here. I, I, I have agreed to talk about heart attacks, their cause and their treatment, about heart failure, the different types and how that's evaluated and treated, um, and valvular uh, heart disease as well and high blood pressure. So it's, it's, a, it's a little ambitious, um, but uh, I think we'll be able to get through the, the main points in an unhurried manner. Um, everyone can hear me okay in the back row? Um, so I'm gonna walk around a little bit. Um, so heart attacks, Coronary disease is a really common condition uh, in the Western world, and now more and more kind of throughout the whole throughout the whole world, as uh, as frankly Western lifestyle uh, has been promulgated kind of throughout the world. So uh, it's it's an issue in low income countries as well as high income countries, and it's a it is a condition that begins really early in life. Am I causing trouble? <laughs> Great. Um, so the, the underpinnings of, of common, the common forms of heart attacks is really a process that begins in teenage years. Uh, there was a study called the P-Day study, the Pathological Determinants of Atherosclerosis in Youth. P-Day is the abbreviation. So it's it an NIH-sponsored trial where the investigators basically did autopsies on young people um, who had died in accidents or because of homicide or suicide and looked at the condition of their aortas and their coronary arteries in their, tw in their teens and 20s and 30s and found a surprisingly high rate, well over 50%, of people having early stages of atherosclerosis um, beginning in the aorta and then moving into the coronaries starting in, in late teenage and years in the 20s. And this has been shown in other studies too of, um, of our servicemen who died uh, in the Korean War or Vietnam War and looking at autopsy specimens. So it's, a, so it's a disease that starts in youth and then usually shows up 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. But the, the, this, the arc of this disease begins very early in life. Um, and essentially, um, the condition is death of, a heart attack is death of heart muscle because of lack of blood flow. That's the, the typical common form of heart attack. And the sensation that people get is, is called angina or angina. The 
word is pronounced both ways is acceptable. And it's it's the that ache that that you get when the muscles aren't getting enough blood flow. So if you put if someone put a tourniquet around your leg or around your arm, they were going to draw blood and they put the tourniquet on your arm but forgot to take it off. After a while, your arm would start to ache or your leg would start to ache with a tourniquet on. That that ache of the muscles not getting enough blood flow is is really the same thing that's happening at the at the level of the heart. Um, and this generally, the the proximate cause, the immediate cause is generally a interruption of blood flow. The the blood vessels to our heart run on the surface of the heart. They're the first exits off the the highway of the aorta. So the heart gets blood before anyone else gets blood. And they're like the, the fuel lines to an engine. And if your fuel line to your, you know, to your lawnmower is, is clogged, it doesn't run well, and the heart's the same. So th this, is, um, this is a busy slide, but this is meant to show in a single slide the, in the entire um, arc of development of atherosclerosis and plaque development. So, um, and it's sort of meant to move time-wise from left to right. So the, you know, the kind of preconditions for vascular disease are some injury to the blood vessel wall. The blood vessel, this is the bloodstream coming through here, and this is the, the top, the lining of the blood vessel. And this is the wall of the blood vessel. So that's the orientation. The, there's uh, a young, healthy person will have um, just beautiful, glistening, smooth walled vessels. The single layer of cells, of endothelial cells, um, was sort of acting like sort of like Teflon on a on a new frying pan. Um, nothing sticks to it. But um, with high blood pressure, with smoking, with diabetes, with uh, um, stress, um, you, you can injure the, this lining. And if, in addition to that, you have um, high level of cholesterol particles, particularly small, dense LDL particles, um, those LDL particles can get so cholesterol is, is packaged into particles. It doesn't flow f freely through the bloodstream. It's, collected, it's, it's trafficked in small particles. Those particles can get between the cells and take up residence in the wall of the blood vessel. And they can be pretty inflammatory. So they start to attract white blood cells, particularly monocytes, that migrate across the wall. They get into the this subintimal layer, and they start um, eating the cholesterol particles, phagocytizing. Those um, monocytes become macrophages, they get bigger, they become foam cells, they, they rupture, and that creates more inflammation. The body starts, uh, the white blood cells are producing signal hormones that attract more white blood cells, so you have this inflammatory state you start to have migration of smooth muscle cells into this area. Um, and you start, as these white blood cells, which are, which are in a Pac-Man type fashion, eating the cholesterol packets, as they get bigger, um, they start to coalesce and form po lipid pools of cholesterol within the wall of the vessel. Meanwhile, blood's just flowing through here and you don't know any different. Um, but it, if during a period of high uh, stress, where blood pressure is high perhaps, um, you're exerting yourself and there's more hemodynamic stress or shear stress on the wall, particularly if the covering of this lipid pool is thin, you can have rupture of the, the cap, the layer over this cholesterol pool, that's a pool of magma. And, now you have an open wound and the
the, the body reacts to that like any other wound and it tries to form a, a scab. Um, and so your body starts forming a clot um, at the site of this plaque rupture. So the, the, the immediate cellular basis for heart attack is generally of evil. So your body has natural clot dissolving tendencies. Your body produces uh, molecules that promote um, clot busting, tissue plasminogen activator in particular. And sometimes those clot busting forces prevail and the, your, your body will heal up that healed plaque. You may, have, may go from a 20% narrowing to a 50% narrowing but no heart attack occurs and you don't, you don't know that it ever happened. Another possibility is clot forms and then dissolves and clot forms and dissolves and it's sort of stuttering and people are, have unstable, that generally can, produces unstable angina. There's sort of this intermittent interruption of flow. And then sometimes a solid plug forms and that vessel is shut down and that's a, the most serious form of a heart attack, the ST elevation MI, where there's no flow. That's, that's a medical emergency where minutes matter, you know, time is muscle. So if someone arrives in the emergency room with unremitting chest discomfort and the EKG suggesting that this vessel is completely blocked, it's a, re, you know, it's a red alarm, it's a five alarm fire, and um, we try to get that patient into a cath lab within 90 minutes. If that can't be done because of distance or weather or transportation, then patients given clock busting medications, uh, thrombolytic medications. If they can get to a cath lab within 90 minutes, that's generally thought to be safer and more effective than the clot busting medication. And once it's in a stable position, a, th a thin flexible wire is advanced through the catheter and out the end of it and then down the blood vessel. And once a wire is on the blood vessel, then a balloon, which has a hole in the center, can be tracked over the wire, just goes where the wire goes, tracks over it, and is expanded to stretch open the, the blockage to prepare it for a stent. That balloon's taken out over the wire, the wire stays down the vessel, and then another balloon goes in with a, with a stent crimped onto the surface, and it looks like chicken wire, and it's been crimped onto the, onto the balloon. It's positioned in place to try to cover the whole area of badness from before the beginning to after the end, and then that water, these are water balloons, so they have more oomph than an air-filled balloon, and the, the stent is deployed and pushed firmly against the wall. The water balloon's withdrawn and the balloon is taken out along with the wire. The stent stays behind as a scaffolding. It's there forever. The body slow, um, grows over a period of time, a layer of tissue over that stent and kind of grows a smooth layer there. That, and we give patients antiplatelet medications to prevent clot from forming. So that's the causes, the, the, path, the kind of pathogenesis, and the treatment of heart attack. Once someone has, once we know someone has heart disease, we, we try to pull all the levers that promote heart disease. We we try to address um, what the American Heart Association terms life's essential eight, and Emily will touch on that and 
has so I have some handouts on kind of a modifiable risk factor, you know, conditions for promoting heart disease. Some some risk factors we can't do anything about. We can't change our age, right, which is a risk factor. We can't change our our family history, or parents, or who our parents are. So these are kind of eight eight things we can do. This is um, a. Patient MI, catheter is coming into the artery, and gently injecting iodine contain, containing dye. The iodine stops the x-ray. It's very um, good at stopping x-rays, so you get good contrast between where the dye is and it isn't. You can see it's an abrupt and complete cutoff here. So that's causing a, a acute MI. What, and this, this is the, kind of the before and after. So a wire's been placed down the vessel, that whole stent procedure's been done, and you have a nice happy um, ending here. <laughs> Great, thank. thank you. Thanks. Ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, Every situation where we can detect damage in a blood test represents uh, a blocked artery. Uh, type 1 infarctions are generally heart attacks caused by blockage. Type 2 are heart, are heart attacks that are generally occur when there's minimal plaque or there's plaque, but the plaque hasn't changed. It's been it's the same as it's always been, but the, the but there's been a demand side problem. The heart has required more blood than it can deliver. So you've had a surge in demand, not a drop in supply. So example would be um, your heart suddenly goes into a fast rhythm and your heart is beating 200 beats a minute and that goes on for an hour. That's pretty unusual stress. Um, or your blood pressure um, goes to 180, 200, and the demand for blood supply is very high. So you, it's a supply-demand problem, but it's, it's primarily a demand problem. Um, so that's, you may hear type, type 2 MI. I mentioned life's essential eight. This is, reminds us to eat a, healthy, a heart healthy diet, which is generally plant based for the most part, although um, modest amounts of animal protein are, are okay. They should be kind of lean and modest size, but you can also get protein from, from plants. You want to try to get 150 minutes or two and a half hours of physical activity per week. So like 30 minutes, five days a week would, would give you 150 minutes. Um, you want to have good blood sugar, either not have diabetes or have diabetes under good control. You want to treat, try to maintain a healthy weight, which is much easier said than done. You want to keep your cholesterol numbers low, particularly the LDL cholesterol or the particle number. You want to keep your blood pressure under control. You don't want to smoke cigarettes and you and the, at new this year is sleep so you want to get seven to nine hours of sleep is what studies have suggested more than nine hours sleep is actually not good less than seven not good so those are it's hard to attack in heart attack in 10 minutes any, any um <laughs> any questions about heart attacks before we move on just yeah. Curious. Okay. I had my stents put in about ten years ago. Okay. Four of them. Okay. And I'm just curious. In, in the, are there any advan advancement? You said there's advancement in testing of whether you've had a heart attack or not, or what the symptoms are, or anything. Yeah. So, I, um, I think you're asking: Is there any advancement on how to tell the status of those stents, or whether other blockages are developing? 
that back to yeah. yeah, or how the stents are working. Yeah. Are they still under warranty? <laughs> um, it, it, this is one of those few situations where time is actually on your side. The longer you go since your stent procedure with no problems, the kind of the less chance there are of having problem with those stents. So stents are not perfect. Um, they have a, they they can fail. They have two main failure modes. Um, one is stent thrombosis. You can form clot on the stent. And that generally is a risk in the first three months before the body has a, has a chance to grow um, of this layer of new cells over the stent. Um, and that's why people are generally on two antiplatelet medications. So once you get past a year or even three months, your chance of stent thrombosis drops off dramatically. The other vulnerability is instant restenosis or scar tissue forming within the stent, kind of rubbery tissue um, that's basically scar tissue. Some people um, will notice if they, they cut themselves, they'll get a big scar, kind of something called proud flesh or big heaped up scar or keloid. It's just exuberant healing. That can happen inside the stent. They're drug coated now. They've been drug coated since around 2003, and that drug coating is to prevent that scar tissue. So that's a risk, you know, it's, it's maybe one to five percent of people, and that's in the, in the first few years. So if you make it past like, the first three years with no problem in that stent, you're probably not going to have any problem with those stents. You could have problems elsewhere in the circulation, um, but those stents probably not going to give you trouble. Where as opposed to bypasses, where the bypass, the, the vein grafts, the risk of blockage of a bypass graft increases with time. To tell whether someone is developing blockages in other vessels, um, we generally rely on, on symptoms. Um, there, people have asked the question, is it a good, would it be a good idea to do stress tests? Uh, if someone had a stent put in last year, should we do a stress test every six months or every year, just for the rest of their life? So that question was asked um, in the DIAD trial. So they took diabetics who were at increased risk of recurrent events and randomized them. Half of them had stress tests on a regular basis. The other one had a stress test only if they had symptoms. And they just watched to see what happened over the next five years. And um, doing routine stress tests in people who felt fine didn't seem to reduce death at all. It was the same death rate, same heart, heart attack rate in the two groups. It led to more heart catheterizations and more repeat stenting, but there was no benefit from that. So a long-winded answer is um, we, we we have, a, I try to have a low threshold for doing testing, but don't not do routine testing. The, the other thing I'd say is for people who are on the fence about whether they should take medica uh, particularly a statin medication to lower cholesterol, they're not sure, they, they know they have somewhat increased risk, but they don't wanna take more pills, I've heard bad things about statins, I don't wanna take that stuff. Sometimes uh, I'll discuss the idea of, idea of doing a CAT scan of their heart arteries, a coronary CT angiogram. CAT scanners have gotten fast enough that we can see the blood vessels of the heart. Heart's the only vessel that's moving in the body, so it's harder to, photo, harder to photograph, essentially. But we can get reasonably good pictures of heart arteries now, and a CAT scan of the arteries can sometimes help someone decide whether they should take a statin or not, because we can say, you already have plaque. Well, we can see it on the CAT scan. You have, you have plaque in multiple vessels and your calcium score is 200. So this is not, we're no longer a theoretical discussion. Like you have atherosclerosis. Does that answer the question sort of? Yeah. Um, so heart failure. Another huge topic, textbooks written on it. Heart failure is a terrible name. It's scary as heck. Um, I, heart failure, to, you know, I think to most people, is synonymous with like cardiac arrest. Um, and it's an unfortunate name, but that's the name that's kind of that's stuck. And it, it, 
that heart failure just means your heart's not working as well as it should. It may be my, very mild, it may be very severe and in your intensive care unit um, and looking at need for a heart transplant. It's, it's a huge spectrum, it all gets the term heart failure. I don't really, I don't really love the term. Um, I, I think cardiomyopathy, which is a mouthful, but is, it is probably a better term. It just means cardio meaning heart, myo meaning muscle, pathy being d disease or condition. So it's a, it's a heart muscle problem. And, and a, a large percent of the population eventually, if you live long enough, have some limitations from your heart. You're, it's like you own a car long enough, eventually the horsepower of that engine is going to diminish. It's not going to generate the same horsepower it did when it rolled off the production, you know, the, the assembly line. So this is a reminder of the circulatory system of all mammals, really. As, uh, as Leslie showed, our heart has four chambers, kind of the staging areas, the atria, or, and then the major pumping chambers, right ventricle and left ventricle. The right ventricle generally has the easy job. Um, it pushes blood through the lungs. There's not much blood pressure in the lungs. It's pretty easy. And so the right ventricle is pretty thin walled. Um, the, there's these valves that are one-way doors supposed to keep the blood going forward, not going backwards. They just open and close based on, this, based on um, the flow of the blood. There's, they don't, there's nothing actively closing them. And then blood picks up, becomes oxygenated, carbon dioxide is expelled when we exhale, and uh, the blood takes on oxygen, oxygen binds to our hemoglobin, the hemoglobin molecule changes color and we have nice red blood comes back to the heart and the heart pumps it out to all the organs of the body. Um, so there's, and every cell in our body needs this fuel, needs oxygen and needs glucose. Really, our, our bodies are really like internal combustion engines. We're combusting carbohydrates, we're burning gas. Kind of, you can think of, you know, gasoline, kerosene, that, these are all um, hydrocarbons. They're not dissimilar from glucose. And, turn, and our body, it's like a car engine or your chainsaw or your wood splitter or your car engine, they're all, you're, you're using oxygen, you're combusting uh, carbon-based fuel and you're producing carbon dioxide. And our bodies are doing the same thing. We're, we're combusting car, uh, fuel with oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. Um, so we have quite a, quite a need for a strong pump to deliver that to deliver that oxygenated blood and the the metabolic fuel. So our our, our heart is like a, it's really an engine that's trying to pull a train around, and um, the the extent to which that engine um, is taxed um, is affects what your exercise tolerance is. Um, Normal heart is not too thick, not too thin. It's, it's a Goldilocks. This is the Goldilocks of um, of hearts. Um, it relaxes. It's thin enough and supple, supple enough to relax and fill easily at low pressure, and then contract and and squeeze well. And the valves work normally. They don't leak, and the electrical system works well. But heart failure is generally divided into two types, um, HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. HEF-REF is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's also called systolic heart failure. The problem is the squeezing phase of cardiac motion. The, best, the heart's been damaged um, or there's a genet maybe a genetic condition or the electrical problem that has caused the heart to enlarge and weaken and it, it can't contract. 
and that's why the cardiac output is diminished. And HEF-PEF, which is actually probably a little more common, more common than HEF-REF, um, the, the heart does not relax well. It, it can't get a full stroke. So I often make the analogy between a, a heart and a, bell, a blacksmith's bellows. So you can imagine a blacksmith with big burly biceps and he's got his bellows and he can squeeze the bellows great, but if it's a small little bellows and you can't get a good stroke of air, you're not going to fan the fire much. You just, you need to get a big fill in, in order to get forward motion. So in half path the problem is, is the filling phase. Um, the other form of heart failure doesn't really fit well into HEF-REF, HEF-PEF, is, is heart failure due to valve problems. Because it's not, it's, not really it's not a problem with squeezing or relaxing. It's a problem of um, inefficiency related to leaky valves. The, the aortic valve can narrow and create an obstruction to flow out to the aorta. It's a common condition. It can also leak the indoor to the left ventricle, the microvalve, the entrance can leak or be narrowed. And then the same way the entrance valve and the exit valve of the right side of the heart can leak or be narrowed. And that, that is, that's, not a, that's not a squeezing problem or a filling problem, that's a, that's a doorway problem. This is a, some people are born with Instead of the normal three leaflets, some people are born with just two leaflets, a bicuspid valve, fairly common, about 1% of the population. They're subject to somewhat premature narrowing of the aortic valve. Um, but narrowing of the aortic valve is very common. And it, and it creates resistance um, to blood flow. Um, this is an illustration of a leaky mitral valve. So the, this creates a volume load on the left ventricle. The heart has to pump the same blood over and over again. It's supposed to be all going out the exit, but half of it's going back through the indoor. So it goes up and then comes back. So the heart's, you know, disadvantaged in having to or repeatedly pump the same blood. So the, how do we evaluate this? Echocardiography is a um, common first step in evaluating someone f with shortness of breath and possible heart failure. It, it, it's non-invasive, gel, uh, ultrasound gel is put in the chest, the, and ultrasound waves are bounced into the patient and bounced back to the same probe and creating a picture. And we get these pictures here. We can look at blood flow, which is color-coded. Um, we can assess the blood flow of the heart in a variety of ways. A nuclear stress test is uh, a common way this is done. A radioactive tracer is injected into the vein of the arm. It's taken up by the heart. The tracer goes where the blood goes. And there's two sets of pictures done, one at stress and one at rest. And then you lay out all the pictures side by side. This is like slicing through a loaf of Italian bread. And there should be uniform distribution of tracer, kind of all walls of the heart. Um, and th this top row is a stress row. This is the rest uh, series. You can see on the stress series, <laughs> On the bottom wall of the heart, there's an area that's not as uh, bright as the surrounding walls, and but at rest it's fine. So this looks like there's a blockage of blood flow to the bottom wall of the heart. You're comparing the, the distribution of tracer. This is slicing the heart the other way, like slicing vertically the lengthways of the Italian loaf of bread. And this is a horizontal long axis. You're slicing the Italian bread sort of parallel to the table. So it's a way to kind of confirm what you think you see in other views. I mentioned, uh, can we dim the lights again for a second? 
I'm going to turn it off. And so I mentioned CAT scans. CAT scans have gotten faster. Um, contrast is injected in the arm. The, the timing of the pictures is such that they're trying to wait for that contrast to get to the arteries and then take the picture while the blood vessels are full of contrast. And you get a, a picture of the arteries. Not everyone is as beautiful as this picture, but that's what you're hoping to see. Um, in this case, you can see a little bit of flex of calcium here. That's a pretty good looking blood vessels. Um, and then cardiac MRI is very useful to, to look at, to characterize the tissue of the heart, the tissue of the muscle itself. Um, for people, this can be claustrophobic inducing. The MRI is a more confined space than a CAT scanner. Um, it doesn't involve radiation, it involves magnetic fields and um, tilting the orientation of the hydrogen atoms in the, in the tissue. Kind of tilt, tilting those hydrogen atoms in one direction and then um, letting them relax. And it generates very, uh, generally very sharp uh, images of the heart, can give you precise measurements of uh, cardiac function, cardiac volume size, and look at the muscle itself. Great, thanks. So how do we treat heart failure? Um, try to identify the un what's causing it. Try to get the root cause. That's kind of true of everything in medicine. And then address the underlying cause if you can. Sometimes someone's uh, is taking a medication that's harmful to the heart, or they're drinking too much alcohol, or they're doing something that's that's straining the heart muscle. Um, try to address any associated disease. If the person has a very overactive thyroid, and that's uh, causing it. If they have severe elevated high blood pressure, if they have heart failure because they're very anemic, you, you address those those causes. If the heart rhythm is out of whack, try to get it back in the normal rhythm or slow it down. If the problem is a plumbing problem, if, there's la if the fuel lines to the heart are plugged, try to open the fuel lines. And if the valves aren't working, fix the valves. That's so it, it's sort of, the, the treatment's tailored to the cause. Um, we, in, in chronic, when, when the heart is not working well, the body stress hormones rev up and um, these fight or flight hormones are, they're helpful in the short run, like in a few minutes or hours, they're deleterious long term. So we tried to shield the heart from these stress hormones. And, and um, for people with weakened pumping action for half ref, um, we generally try to get them on a beta blocker, an angiotensin receptor and neprilysin inhibitor agent a mineralocorid uh, receptor antagonist, and a sodium glucose co-transport inhibitor. So we try to give them a four class medications. We try to, if they're congested, their lungs are full of fluid, try to get them to pee off that extra fluid. So diuretics are commonly used. We try to, no matter what their initial level of, of health, exercise is helpful. We try, try to promote fitness. Depression, discouragement are common with heart disease. Try to address the mental health issues. And, um, and throughout the entire course, but especially at the end of life, really provide compassion and comfort. So that's heart failure. Wow, I covered, <laughs> um, covered a lot. Yeah. Any questions about heart failure? Heart valves, that's what I would talk about, but I, I kind of. I, Kind of wrap that in with heart failure. So I'm going to finish with hypertension. How am I doing time-wise? I'm over by like 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make this brief. High blood pressure, sometimes called a silent killer. Um, those who doesn't cause, but most of us don't know we have high blood pressure unless it's really high, and then we can get headaches or blurred vision or chest pain or shortness of breath, but your blood pressure can be pretty high and you don't know it at all. And no one really thanks you, I gotta complain for a minute, no one really thanks you for treating their blood pressure. No, like, 
They don't really thank you ever. They <laughs> usually are upset if I haven't taken another pill. Yeah. But we're, we're doing it um, because we're trying to prevent stroke. High blood pressure in the brain is a major risk factor for stroke. We're trying to keep maintain people's vision. We're trying to prevent heart failure down the line, long after you've forgotten us. We're trying to prevent heart attacks. We're trying to prevent kidney failure. And we're trying to maintain blood flow to important organs. So, getting back to where I started here. Um, blood pressure is reported as two numbers, systolic over diastolic. Um, and generally in home readings, we'd like to see the, the, your average reading of being less than 130 on top and less than 80 on the bottom. The top number is the blood pressure when the heart's squeezing, and the low number is the blood pressure when the heart's refilling. So if you measure blood pressure, if you can measure blood pressure continuously, like with a catheter in the artery, it's a it's a sine wave. Right? It's 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 changing every second, every tenth of a second. And the systolic is the high number, diastolic is the low number. And it's the four, it creates pressure on the wall of the vessel. Um, Emily and Leslie and I are big, big proponents of home blood pressure readings because a lot of people do have some degree of office hypertension, and um, and Leslie will, uh, Emily will get into this. Uh, is that true? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, so the, the, the kind of, this is a drill we, that we recommend that you that you pick a time of day when you're not stressed. Uh, when you can relax, um, we haven't had a cup of coffee in in the last hour. You haven't had a fight with with some a loved one, and you you haven't just watched the news. And, <laughs> and you s put the cuff on your arm, sit at the kitchen table, and just sit there in silence for a full five minutes. Go to your happy place, and then push the button on your electric blood pressure cuff that fits on your upper arm. Doing this better than the rest and get a blood pressure reading. Wait two minutes, do it again, wait two minutes, do it again. So three readings after five minutes of rest. If one arm is higher than the other, use the higher arm. So and if you did that once a day for three or four days, you'd have nine or 12 blood pressure readings. And you add up the systolic numbers, the top numbers, and divide by nine. Add up the bottom numbers, divide by nine you'll have your average, and you'll, that's, that's a good number to go by rather than the one reading you got in the doctor's office when you were like hustling it and you were late or you were annoyed by kept being kept waiting. So ideally, blood pressure less than 120 over 80, pretty, hot, pretty hard to achieve this. Um, I'm frankly happy if we can keep uh, pre readings below 130. Uh, and 80, but that's technically considered elevated. And then high blood pressure um, begins with a blood pressure above 130 and above 80. And stage two hypertension begins with blood pressure above 140, and then hypertensive crisis above 180. That's not this distinct from hypertensive emergency, which is different, but that's that's the current classification system. That's why we care. And um, so medications are sometimes needed for high blood pressure, but there's things we can do lifestyle-wise. We can eat less salt. We can walk. We can avoid ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, these agents which can raise blood pressure. And uh, we can reduce or eliminate alcohol, which if you're drinking more than you should, which is two two servings for men and one serving for women, if you're drinking more than that, um, you're, that, that can have an effect on elevating blood pressure. Many folks need more than one medication. Sometimes two doses, two low, to, to low, a low dose of two meds is better than one. Sometimes you need to try different medications. And these are different classes. Which sometimes we choose based on what other medical problems you have. And that's all. So.
Um, mm -hmm. Take questions, yeah, informally, I guess, later. So next we have Emily Russell, she's one of our RNs. So I am Emily, and I am with a nurse working in the cardiology department here at Gifford with both Bruce and Leslie, and I'm going to keep this short and sweet. Um, I do have a couple of things you can look at um, at the end if you're interested, but I am going to sort of give my top three tips on how you can be your own best advocate um, at your doctor's visit. Um, and the first is being an active participant in the conversation um, versus just physically being present and not really taking in all of the information. Um, come with a list of questions if you feel like if you're going to go to the doctor's office and maybe you're not going to remember everything that you want to ask, come with a list. Um, try to keep it maybe to the top three most important concerns that you have at the time. Um, and consider potentially bringing a family member or a friend who can be your support person, an extra set of ears who may be able to take notes for you. Um, again, if you feel like you're not going to maybe remember everything that has been talked about, not a bad idea to have a second set of ears. Um, you know, sometimes if you're feeling nervous or if you're not feeling well that day, you may not be able to take in all the information that you need. Um, so having an extra set of ears there would be good. Um, my second tip here is probably the most important, I think, is coming prepared to your visit, um, making sure you have a medication list with you that is current and up to date. Um, part of my job is before you see the doctor to um, verify your list of current medications and your list of allergies, um, your medical history and things like that. Um, and if you come with a list, whether it's handwritten or we have the ability to print out a list for you, um, it makes it very simple and um, easy for everybody if you have that prepared. And we do have a couple different styles. These um, actually fold up into a nice little wallet size um, square here. And this bigger one offers more information. Um, this one I really, I think is really helpful. Um, you can put your medication here and what is it for and I think knowing what you're taking and why you're taking it is really important. There's a lot of people out there that don't necessarily know why they're taking certain medications. So having a list that you can also look back on and say, oh yeah, I'm taking this because of my blood pressure. Um, very helpful for everybody. Um, and if you are a new patient to any clinic, not just cardiology, um, having maybe a brief little medical summary that lists maybe procedures that you've have done in the past. Um, if you are a patient at another hospital, um, having some of their records available will also be helpful to the providers taking care of you so they can get the full picture. Um, and again, if you are here for um, blood pressure, having that home blood pressure log, which there is a little handout in the back if you're interested in maybe starting that. Um, having your home blood pressure readings at your office visit so we can compare, you know, what is your office visit reading versus your home reading. Um, pretty important. Um, and then understanding um, using effective communication with your healthcare team um, and what sort of communication is available to you. Um, you can certainly call us on the phone to report any questions or concerns that you may have been having. Um, and there is a patient portal, which we also have a little handout, which I would recommend. You can get lab results and direct communication with your providers. Um, that being said, the portal is not to report emergent situations. Um, that is where you'd want to pick up the phone and call myself or your primary care um, and just say like, hey, you know, I'm really not feeling well. If you're having chest pain, that's certainly not something you want to just type a message to your doctor to. Um, that requires more immediate um, intervention. So um, 
that's all I have. Um, so being an active participant and being engaged, coming prepared, and knowing how to use your communication effectively. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Do you need stretch breaks? Everyone's okay? Shift a little bit? All right, you look good. I am Dr. Courtney Riley. I am a pediatrician, actually, by training. Um, and I would love to talk to you today a little bit about a genetic um, cause of early heart disease and strokes. Um, and it's called lipoprotein A or LP little a. And you might hear me use them interchangeably today. Um, and if you're wondering why a pediatrician is talking to you about it, well, this runs in my family. Um, I first heard about this about 10 years ago um, when my dad was in his 40s and he was on his like fifth or sixth stent with relatively normal LDL levels. And the doctors were like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> you should have your um, LP little a tested. He had this tested and it was elevated. Because it's genetic, they recommended that um, my brother, sister, and I also get tested. And my brother and sister also had it elevated. Um, they were children at the time. And so the doctor said, don't worry about it. There's really nothing you uh, need to do until you're older. Whew, this is my baby sister. <laughs> Sorry, was not expecting. About two years, two years ago, she went to sleep and never woke up. Um, she had a heart attack at 23. It was her first one. So the advice we got <laughs> to wait was wrong. Um, and I've since learned a lot about it and I really want to share that with you today. So thank you. This is a relatively old slide, but it's fascinating to me. This is from um, 2016 and it talks about the causes of death in the United States and what we um, are interested in and what the media reports on. So the first column is looking at what we die from. Heart disease is number one, um, 30, over 30% 30 of um, people in the US will die from heart disease. The second column is what are we Googling? What are we afraid of? What are we interested in? 2% of Google searches are on heart disease. Um, a lot of it is cancer. The media is the last two columns. It's looking at two different um, uh, magazines and what they looked at over a course of a year. And again, only about 2% of what they talk about is heart disease. So there's obviously some room here. And then a little bit more recently, 2020, what were you watching on TV all the time? What were we talking about all the time? Was COVID, right? But still, even in 2020, COVID was only the third leading cause of death. It was still heart disease, and we're not really giving it um, enough attention. So, LP little a is incredibly common. Everybody has some LP little a, but when it's elevated, that's the problem. Um, and it is considered elevated in one in five people worldwide, not just the United States. Um, so that means about 1.4 billion people worldwide has elevated LP little a. I, I don't know about you, but when a number is that big, it actually means nothing to me. So I've broken it down to get a little closer to home. So in Vermont, um, over 600,000 people um, it, and as of 2019. So one in five suggests that over 120,000 people has elevated LP little a. If we're looking in our town of Randolph, about 2,158 people were here in 2019. Um, so 431 people in our town alone have that counted. There's about 25 people in this room today. So that means about five of you also have elevated LP little a. And as in the case with any genetic condition, if you catch one person, you catch more who have this, right? So this is my family of five, my mom, dad, brother, and sister. And in my family of five, actually four of us have elevated LP little a. So I think um, to help talk about what it is, it helps to take a step back and look at what LDL is. Um, typically when we talk about cholesterol in like the public general sense, what we're actually talking about is our LDL and our HDL. These are terms that you've probably heard many times, right? Technically, cholesterol is these little yellow particles that are in the center of this ball. Cholesterol is not a bad thing necessarily, right? Our cells need cholesterols for our cell membranes. It's important for hormone production, um, but most of the cells actually make all the cholesterol they need. We don't need all this extra cholesterol. Um, 
but we have it. And when we have it, it can't go through the bloodstream on its own because it's hydrophobic, so it gets packaged into these little particles, right? And so that blue ApoB100 is a protein that, part of that um, for an LDL particle makes it so that that cholesterol can kind of run through the bloodstream. They have more dense particles that are more tightly packed, and those are called HDL, um, your high-density lipoproteins. So lipoprotein A is actually a, like an LDL-like particle. So it's got, is this the pointer? Yeah, it's got this LDL-like core with that same protein, but then it's got this other thing called apolipoprotein A, because they like to make things very long, <laughs> um, which is just all of these little kringles. And so it's basically LDL with a twist. They call these kringles because they look like a kringle. Mm -hmm. So that's cute. But it, what happens here, there are um, a bunch of repeats on here. And this is really the part that can be variable. This is the genetic part. There can be any number of copies from 1 to 40 of these in each individual person. Um, and so the reason that these kringles are really important is because they look like something else that our body also has. So you may have noticed um, Dr. Anders mentioned plasminogen quickly when he was talking about blood clotting. Um, so plasminogen is a precursor to plasmin, and plasmin is important to break down blood clots. Well, these kringles over here look a lot like this, so they get in the way. And so basically, when you have a lot of these running around, your LP little A's, you're not getting that same blood clotting breakdown that you need. So the blood clots stick around longer. So, it's generally well understood that LDL is bad. You might have heard us say this is the bad cholesterol, right? Well, if LDL is bad, then LP little a is also bad, but maybe even worse. And so it, there's really a trifecta going on here with LP little a when it comes to heart disease. So it has the lipid properties, so it's getting deposited in the walls of the arteries, um, just like we already talked about. I, I don't talk about this too much, but it also actually can deposit on the... Um, valves of the uh, aorta as well um, and can it can lead to aortic stenosis um, but it also has these thrombotic properties which means it can cause blood clots because of inhibiting that breakdown and then this part i didn't even actually mention yet but it also has inflammatory properties and so if i go back this little um sunburst here is an oxidized phospholipid that stays there and basically this particle is like a bomb that's carrying its own match. This is just coming around, it disrupting the endothelial layers like we already talked about. And so it's, it really is just like everything you need in one, one particle. It is genetically determined. We get two, um, one allele from each parent and both are expressed actually. So you can have two different types of LPA particles in your blood system, or you do have it at any time. Um, and again, the part that is variable are these repeats. Um, when I first kind of heard about this, I thought, oh, so the more of those repeats you have, the worse your LPA is. That's actually not true, though. It's because the ones that are smaller get reproduced faster in the liver. So actually, if you have the smaller number of repeats, you're more likely to have a higher number of these particles floating around. And this level um, remains we think relatively constant throughout life, um, and it reaches this level by age five. So if you get your LP little a tested or your lipoprotein A tested um, at any point in your life, you can generally think that's, you can figure out where you fall in that risk category. So if this is so prevalent and it is so dangerous, why don't more people know about it? Well, testing is pretty controversial still. Um, in my training, anytime, you know, in the lecture halls or on the wards, the kind of phrase that got repeated is, if this is not gonna change my management, I'm not gonna test for it. If I can't offer my patients anything, then why would I wanna know that it exists? That's a little paternalistic, first of all, but also, um, yet. There's nothing yet. Um, but things are definitely in the works. Um, and I will talk about one of them after. 
but the other thing is we talked a lot about other things you would do to lower your risk factors keeping your LDL low, avoiding medications and situations that increase your risk of blood clots. And then I think also, I didn't put on here before, but empowering you to feel like, especially like as my sister was a young woman um, who had symptoms, but they were, they were always like, oh, that's anxiety, that's anxiety. Um, so I think it would, knowing this information would empower you to be like, maybe <laughs> it's anxiety, but also can you check my heart? Um, and then the more we know, the once it becomes more well known how widespread um, and deadly this is, that's going to be what drives research and change. It's sort of awful to think about um, money, but that's what pharmaceutical companies think of. And if they realize how many people would benefit from a medication like this, I think then they'll start to notice it might be worth their time. Um, so they are finding out that it is a little bit hard, understatement, to break down LP little a, um, but what they're finding improvement with is actually preventing the production in the first place. And so they're doing a, a few different studies um, and they're actually having seemingly good tolerance and, and some pretty good response rates. Um, so hopefully uh, pretty soon we'll have some actual answers. So I tried to tell you all the most important things, but there's so much else to say. Um, so if you are interested in other lectures, I found these ones to be the most helpful, um, but I'm sure there are, there's plenty of other um, information out there for you. And I, I, it just feels so big to me right now that there's, I feel like there's a lot of forward movement with this and change. And so I'm excited to see kind of where it goes. And these are my references. Are there any questions? Yes. So what is it? What does the what does the test the, the test for LPA? Is that something? It's a blood test. It's a blood test. So it's a simple blood test. You just need to test once um, in your life with the caveat that actually does go up in women after menopause, so women maybe want to test twice. Um, and I asked the Gifford lab, and um, out of pocket would be $114. You can order it through like Quest or other places, and it's as low as 30, I saw. Um, and actually, Gifford has added it to our, our um, like lipid screening that about once in every patient's life, we would do an LP little a screening. So if you haven't had it done yet, ask about it. Our providers are informed. So would that be like included in a CBC? It is not a CBC, but you could get it at the same time. Yeah, um, if, if you're having a venipuncture or a blood test for anything else, you can ask your doctor to add it on. Seems fairly bizarre, I guess. I've never heard of it before. I know, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. It, I, but it really, like, I, when I was a medical student is when my dad was diagnosed, and I, I looked for it, I listened for it. And in four years of training, and then three years of post-training, I heard it one time, and it was a tiny two sentences in a Robin's Pathology, and it just said, this is genetic, might increase your risk. And I was like, oh, that's fine, that's not gonna change my life. Since the 60s. 60s. Best kept secret <laughs> until now. Tell your friends <laughs> and your family. One of the things you mentioned was avoiding med or watching medications that might for blood clots, et cetera. Is that not really our PCP or our pharmacists? I mean, how do we know? It, it, a partnership for sure. So in my so I'm a pediatrician, um, so I don't often put um, kids on things that would cause these. Right. But this is and this is a full disclosure. My this is not studied yet, but um, estrogen can cause blood clots. So can this. And so as a pediatrician, birth control is what I prescribe kind of most. I personally will not prescribe a birth control to a young woman unless I know she does not have this because I do think that that played a role in what happened with my sister. Um, so yes, I think that is one thing that you can know um, and then have that conversation with your doctor. Like if you have that, you can just say, just throw it out there. Like if they're gonna give you a new medication, does this increase my risk of blood clots? Cause I do have this. And please do that because your doctor only has like 15 minutes to see you. So if you could throw in those important things, that'd be great. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Walter Ziski. I'm a care coordinator. That's a fancy title for a social worker light, um, a little bit down, but I'm also a health coach. So I'm going to talk to you about three concepts today, which is nutrition, self-management, and um, health coaching. As you can see, the, the middle one, self-care, is not um, selfish. So where is my button here? Oh, I moved it. All right. So nutrition. Talk about uh, Mediterranean healthy eating, uh, low sodium, ultra processed food, and processed foods. There's my down arrow. There we go. All right. So the benefits of Mediterranean, Mediterranean eating are, hold on, I might have missed a slide here. Let me just make sure. No, I didn't miss a slide. They um, reduce the risk for heart, heart hypertension, stroke, uh, some types of cancer, and osteoporosis. And we'll get into Mediterranean eating in a little bit. Lower sodium. Um, it's recommended for anybody who has high blood pressure or hypertension to consume no more than 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. And that's not just the salt you might put on your food. That's also what's included in any processed food that you might eat. And where do you find that? When you look on food labels. Sorry, I've got to look over here more. So um, make sure, you know, calories are important but also looking at other um, factors. So you want to start with what the serving size is. This happens to be a mac and cheese. Check the calories. There's, there's two servings in this container. And then you also want to limit the ones that have total fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, as we heard about cholesterol, sodium, of course, and then also get enough of your good nutrients, which is dietary fiber and your vitamins of course, the footnote, which is your recommendations. And the state of Vermont and food labels have actually gotten a little bit better, where they've made the, the most important things a little bit larger. Um, they've actually, actually showed you how many servings are in a container and what the calories are. Um, we can talk a little bit about ultra-processed and processed foods. So the three main ingredients that they put in processed foods to make them tasty and you want more of them is fat, salt, and sugar. Anything that's lower in fat that they call low fat usually has an increase in salt and sugar. Anything that's low sugar, they usually increase the fat and the sodium. Anything that's what, what did I miss? So fat, sugar. So anything that's low sugar, they increase the other two. So, show of hands, how many, is, how many of you have ever eaten one donut in a sitting? <laughs> Two? Three? Four? Okay. The reason why I say that is think about what we consume for sugar. In this Dunkin' Donuts, and I'm not against Dunkin' Donuts, I actually used to work at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, think about how many grams of sugar are in this drink. So not only what we eat, but also what we drink. So thinking about that. And that's like, all right, Walter, now I can't eat anything. I can't drink anything. Of course you can. I missed like three slides. Hold on. All my Mediterranean diet went away. All right, that's okay. So how do you help? How do we help you? You've gotten a lot of information today. So there's a few programs out there that can assist you with changing your lifestyle, changing your diet. Dr. Andrews talked about that essential eight. Um, there's also a concept called lifestyle medicine, which talks about whole food, predominantly plant-based. Talks about physical activity, restorative sleep, not just getting sleep, but also restorative sleep, stress management, um, avoidance of risky substances, and then also very good social interactions. So one of the things that the state of Vermont says is we love our citizens, we want them to be healthy. So they've developed a number of programs which are clinically based, which are studied, and um, it's called self-management. So that's where the self-care comes in. So this, these are mostly online. We've gone back into in-person in some cases since COVID is diminished. Um, so these are a couple of the high blood pressure self-management classes that are offered. Now the advantage is these are free. Just takes a little bit of your time. 
They generally run an hour to 90 minutes and eight classes. And again, it's free. <laughs> so high blood pressure management. So these are some of the concepts that are gone over. And actually, this program was the one that the state of Vermont is using currently is the one that was developed by Clemson University. Um, and the workshops are met, meet for 90, min for 90 minutes over eight weeks. They talked about the bank's basics of hypertension control. They talk about nutrition. They talk about physical activity. They talk about stopping tobacco, stress management, medication management. And then at the last class, class number seven, you might say, well, where's the, where's the number eight? But um, it's in there. Talk about long-term planning. So you meet for the eight weeks, and then you make a plan for the next six months. Because lifestyle change is not overnight. It takes time. So meeting for those eight weeks just gets you trying new things, modifying things just a little bit, small steps. Um, and then you think about the next six months. What do you want, what's one change you want to commit to? So I, I do, I am a lifestyle coach for uh, the, the high blood pressure uh, management class. I'm also diabetes prevention, diabetes self-management. I wear many hats. Um, my wife says, why are you doing another class, Walter? Because I like to do them. Um, I had one gentleman who came in, his physical activity kind of stayed the same, but he was able to lower his blood pressure, his high number from 160 down to about 140, 142, just in those eight weeks. And that small change actually reduces your risk. Sorry, I'm just trying to think of the statistics. Um, it's maybe a, a, a 10 to 15 point drop in your high number reduces your risk of stroke or heart attack by over 30%. So just a small change. So when he started reading labels, he went, oh my word. He was eating Dinty Moore hash. And he looked at the sodium level in that. 800 in one serving. And then he looked at the serving size of his can. Two servings. 1,600 servings of sodium. So sodium, so sugar, they all lead to higher blood pressure. And I can tell you why sugar leads to higher blood pressure. So you want a healthier heart. Sugar increases your insulin levels, which in turn activates and motivates your nervous system, which then increases your, 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 your heart rate. So reducing the sodium, reducing the sugar. So he was able to reduce that. And he also looked at, what's my cereal? Oh, I'm going to go with this because that no no sodium in it. That one had sodium. So he was able to reduce it just by that. So healthy eating reduces the risk for hypertension, stroke. Did I go back? All right, here we go. So one of the concepts that came out of the uh, self-management class, this one for Clemson, is a concept I really loved. And it's, uh, it's called Go, Slow, and Woe Foods. So Go Foods. Usually are low amounts of fat and sh added sugar and sodium. You can almost enjoy these anytime. So these are fruits and vegetables, whole grain foods without added fats, low fat milk and milk products, and lean cuts of meat. So the use, uh, yes, I, I love graphics, so I got this little stop sign that says go in a heart. Your slow foods, foods that high levels in fat and added sugars. They're, they're more than the go foods. So vegetables that are prepared with fats and sauces. Canned vegetables, one of the recommendations, if you do enjoy canned vegetables, I had one gentleman who says, I love my canned peas. It's like, okay, but look at the sodium content in it. So if you do get canned vegetables, it's recommended to rinse them, because that'll reduce some of the sodium in there. White bread, French toast, things like that, white rice. Brown rice has the same number of um, things that just has a little bit more fiber in it. Fruit that is canned in syrup versus fruits that's canned in juices. 2% uh, low fat milk, whole eggs cooked without added fat. Those are your slow foods. So, I'll get into this. Your woe foods, fried foods, baked goods, going back to those donuts, cakes, pies, smoked or cured meats, whole milk, pickled vegetables, pickles, regular soda, salty, chips. A food can be a go, slow, and woe food. So they could be chicken, baked, no skin. That's the go category. A potato, potato's good, it's baked. 
then it goes in the category if it's baked with skin. Potato, if you add butter and sour cream. The woe well food is when a chicken is fried or you turn it into french fries. So, health coaching. This is my favorite topic, actually. Health coaching is not somebody yelling at you with a microphone. It's also not this. You are not done when I tell you you're done. If anybody knows, this is Jillian Michaels, you know, biggest loser. Health coaching is supportive. It's empowering for you. It's future focused as well. We don't say, oh, why did you do that? Kind of thing. So this like, ask the expert, you're the expert. I always tell people I'm the expert in behavioral change because I've been trained in that. You're the expert in your own life and what fits into your life. What change you want to make. You decide what path you want to make. And we have two health coaches currently um, at Gifford, myself and Carolyn Higgins. So, so we create a vision. Where are you at and where do you want to go? And how do we get you there? We work out a plan, all right? We go out three months. What behaviors do you want to see? What things do you want to be doing to be able to make improvements in your life, that lifestyle change? And then we go weekly into creating that path. We check in. We talk about goals. Is a goal too high? Is a goal too, too easy? It's always the simplest. It's usually the best. You make those small changes. And then we review the progress. The goal of health coaching is for participants to learn that they can make small incremental changes that have a significant positive impact on their long-term health. You really have the majority of the power to make changes in your life. The nice thing about health coaching is I'm free. We're free. So I like, the, I like this quote by, uh, I think it's Jim Rubin, take care of your body is the only place you have to live which is very true. Questions? Oh, come on, there's got to be something. What would you consider a good breakfast? One that you eat every day that works for you. Yeah. That's healthy for you. Is it, a, is it good for you, though? I mean, some of the breakfasts, I'm, I'm 80, yep. and some of the breakfasts that I do see people eat, I don't see how they can survive on it. And then is it doing them any good? I mean, how much stuff is processed? It's all based around something easy. Sure. You know, they eat Nago waffles in the morning. Is that, is that a considered a good breakfast? What's, what's the balance? If, if so one of the concepts is, um, is half of your plate low starch vegetables or fruit? Is ha a quarter of your plate a protein? And is a quarter of your plate a grain? So if you think about that throughout your day, are you getting 50% of your calories from low starch vegetables? Are you getting a quarter of your, your calories from some sort of protein, healthy lean protein? And then you incorporate a, a quarter. So think about the, the process. And this is an uphill battle because I'm going to try to not go down too big of a tangent. When the federal government went after the tobacco company, the tobacco company said, how can we make money? So they buy, started buying up some of the food companies. And they took the addictiveness that they created in the tobacco and they put it into the food industry. Think of your grocery store 20, 30, 40 years ago. You really had mostly non-processed food. But now you walk down the middle of the grocery store and what do you see? Processed, 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 processed. So thinking about everything in moderation and that's what we can help with, you know, you spend maybe 20 minutes, maybe 40 minutes if you're lucky with your doctor. With the self-management class, you spend eight weeks. With health coachings, I've been health coaching some people for over a year. And I usually do it 30 minutes a week. Sometimes we go every other week, sometimes we go once a month. I have one person we meet monthly. Um, and it's just making those changes. So going back to your question, a healthy breakfast. There's so much study out there, but within that frame, 50% low starch vegetables and fruit, quarter, quarter protein and a quarter grain, some sort of that. And try to be as less processed as you can because all the additives and all of that, and I won't get into the pesticides and all of that either. But any other questions? Look at that. I'm right on time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay.
Well, that's all we have for you today. So thank you all for coming. Um, before we go, are there any questions for any of our presenters? I know they asked throughout. Okay. There are some. Can I have a question? Yes. Can I get one of them just to mention SVT? I'm new to that, and so even though it's been explained to me, I don't feel like I totally understand it. Yeah, sure. So uh, SVT uh, stands for supraventricular tachycardia, <coughs> and it's it's an umbrella term for a, a few different arrhythmias, but they all have in common that they're fast, meaning above 100 beats per minute, and they're coming and they're coming from the upper chambers. Um, and they can they uh, span quite a spectrum of severity. Some people have SVT with runs of extra beats that last as few as five or six beats. Other people will have runs of SVT that go on for half an hour, an hour. And they vary in how fast they are. Some may be very fast, 180, 190 beats a minute, and very debilitating. And others are much slower, 110 beats a minute. Um, they're mostly nuisance arrhythmias, or generally not life-threatening arrhythmias. Uh, but they can be, they can really compromise someone's quality of life. And the first step is to try to understand why it's happening and if are there any um, reversible causes. Um, and then. And that you would address that first. If that's not effective, you consider medications, and you can also talk to consider a catheter-based based treatment, where catheters are uh, passed through a vein in the leg up into the heart, and try to map that area to show exactly where the rhythm starts, and then try to abolish it with uh, with radio, generally with radio frequency energy. But it, it, it's it covers a wide range of conditions, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Does atrial trivial fibrillation always mean a lack of oxygen? Yeah, so um, I think everyone heard the questions. Does it always mean a lack of oxygen? No. Um, yeah. As you recall from Leslie's talk, atrial fibrillation um, is our, our abnormal rhythm where the upper chambers have disorganized activity and the upper chambers are just quivering. It can drive the heart to go too fast. Um, so some people sh show up, be they know they have AFib because the heart rate is 130 or 150 beats per minute. Um, and that gen none, usually does not cause low oxygen. Could low oxygen be a cause of AFib? That's possible. Say you're in the hospital with severe pneumonia and um, your oxygen levels are low, that could sometimes be a trigger for AFib. AFib doesn't usually cause low oxygen level unless you were to develop you know, severe congestive heart failure. Then, then maybe the AFib is causing. Is that what you're asking? Am I um, yes. barking up the right tree? Okay. Any other questions for me? Yes. Dr. Andrews, where is the closest cath lab? Uh, Dartmouth, Hitchcock would be closest, and then and UVM next closest. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay, great. Thanks for everyone's attention and thank interest. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. For Just remind everybody yes. to hand out. Yes, and there are some handouts in the back for you to take with you. Um, some are about nutrition, and then there are some other that... Um, about blood pressure and medication yes. lists. Yes, so feel free to take those with you, and please feel free to take any snacks with you or coffee. Um, healthy, <laughs> healthy, healthy snacks. Yes. Go, go snacks, right, Walter? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, so, and thank you for attending. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. <laughs>